Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, February 7th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for February 7th, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during these sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Resnick. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. And to begin the meeting, I would just like to um, make a note of a minor update regarding consent item number 13. The assessment for 1860 Hebe associated with property owners David Northway and Loris Freiholter is removed from the schedule of assessments. Uh, the schedule of assessments has been amended to remove this assessment, and that is the schedule that council will be adopting tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mayor Kavanaugh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, thank you, Adrian. I invite everyone who is able to please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Adrian. Under presentations, we have the COVID-19 update. All right, Mary Rose. Good evening, Rose. Mayor. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Mr. Mayor and City Council members, uh, this is Mary Rose Corrigan, Public Health Specialist with the City of Dubuque Health Services Department, here to give you an update on the latest COVID information. And I'll just wait till I get the screen share sign here. And I'll bring up my slides. Okay, I think we're ready to go here. So as a reminder, um, we continue to operate in conjunction with the incident management team as representatives, um, Stacy Killian from the VNA, Tom Berger, our emergency management agency coordinator, Samantha Cloth, the Dubuque County Health Department interim director, myself, and also our staff from each of those organizations. So this is the overall epidemiological curve, um, which began in April of 2020. And you can see at the right, far right-hand side, we are at a higher peak than ever in terms of number of cases. And in fact, last Tuesday, the World Health Organization reported that we've had 90 million cases in the last 10 weeks since Omicron was first identified. And that's actually more that was 
reported in all of 2020. So our seven day total here on a local basis that we report every week on our public health update, last week indicated a significant update, uptick. This is partly due to the laboratory catching up with analyzing and reporting all the tests it's received in the last several weeks due to this Omicron surge. I do believe we'll see, um, so far we have seen decrease in cases um, in the last seven days um, since our last report. So this week, um, if the reporting is all caught up, we should see those actual number of cases going down. Our positivity rate for the last seven days has decreased to 9% and it has been much better over the past several weeks. So this is how all the cases uh, were reported out during January according to age group. And throughout the month, the 19 to 24 year old age group had the highest number of cases. And in the latter part of the month, we saw more cases um, in the zero to 10 year old child uh, age group. And you can see on this slide, they had 9%. But overall, um, lately and with this Omicron surge, it's definitely been a affecting young adults and now children. And the, as we're still calculating um, the Omicron on an ongoing basis, of the positive tests reported in January that were further tested for Omicron in Dubuque County, 96% of those sampled um, have been positive for Omicron. So that's by far the dominant variant and the remaining are Delta variant. And in the state, they um, are at about 93%. So we'll probably start seeing what February looks like in another week or so as more of those um, positive um, tests get further analyzed. Our hospital, um, reports. Uh, we have good news on that front. Their number of COVID patients has decreased significantly. The slide on the left, which shows 14 reported last Wednesday, is what the hospitals report um, directly to the media and to the incident management team. And the uh, graph is what's shown on the state website as of last Wednesday. Um, there's probably a day or two difference in reporting there, um, but they also show the age groups of those that were hospitalized and that the number of people uh, unvaccinated that are hospitalized for COVID has decreased to 48% um, in that metric. Vaccinations continue to kind of crawl upward. Um, we in January, we reported just over 30,000 booster doses given, and um, now we're up to 33,000. So that, that's slowly climbing um, in conjunction with our percentage of total population vaccinated, and that is of those eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, those are the numbers. So another note in uh, preparing for FDA and CDC approval for emergency youth authorization of the Pfizer vaccine for zero to five-year-olds. Um, we're working in conjunction with Iowa Department of Public Health to assess and order vaccines for the youth county providers, um, which will ensure the timely distribution and administration of that pediatric uh, vaccine. To, and of course, pending FDA approval and CDC approval, and we expect those to be reviewed in late February. And this is how we um, vaccinated, um, ba really based on the last year per month. We, um, in January, the number of fully vaccinated people increased by 958. So it continues to slowly climb. And this is how we kind of compare with the rest of the state um, and you can see these um, where you can find vaccines available in the local community are available on this website, which is our on our website, the city of Dubuque, and also the Dubuque County website. And VNA also continues to offer walk-in 
vaccinations at their site at 660 Iowa on Mondays and Fridays. And really, if they have staff available, they will um, give you a vaccine anytime that works for you. Now, last week, um, the governor announced that the state public health disaster emergency proclamation would end uh, February 15th. So what does that exactly mean? Um, for public health and the public, it means a few things. First of all, our, this, the public websites that have all of the vaccine and <coughs> incidence data, death data, et cetera, will be decommissioned. So coronavirus.iowa.gov and vaccinateiowa.gov will go away. Uh, data will be published on the Iowa Department of Public Health website beginning February 16th. And um, the, I, the state is now working on switching that data over. Not all of it will be about available, but most of the data the public has um, will be on that website. There will be a couple exceptions because long-term care facilities do not have to report their outbreaks to Iowa Department of Public Health. They already do that to CMS and that'll continue. And hospitals will not be reporting data to the Iowa, to Public, Iowa Department of Public Health either. They will only be reporting to um, the federal HHS or Health and Human Services Department. And the vaccine finder tool will no longer be available. Um, and right now, long-term care facilities and hospitals are, in a sense, they're having to report to both state and federal agencies. This will ease their burden of reporting somewhat since they'll only have to report to um, federal agencies. But the incident management team um, keeps in contact with these um, groups and meets weekly, if not more often, with the hospitals. So we'll still have a pulse on um, their capacity and any needs they may have. And also with the testing component, um, Iowa Department of Public Health no, will no longer require negative test reports beginning at, on February 16th. Um, right now they require positive and negative tests to be reported. So this is not required of all of most communicable diseases, usually just the positive cases are reported. So with the removal of the negative test reporting requirements, that will um, not, we won't be able to um, calculate a positivity rate for like seven or 14 days like we have been in the past. However, uh, local public health will still have access to the number of uh, tests being administered somewhat um, through our meeting with the local um, testing providers. Test Iowa kits will still be available um, and you can also still order them from the federal website. Our healthcare providers continue on limited allocation for testing supplies. Um, I meet with them tomorrow, so hopefully that will be improving. As I mentioned uh, in January, uh, we were recommending that we discontinue contact tracing on an individual basis, um, and that Board of Health did approve that recommendation. And we've implemented many of our strategies on getting new messaging and information out to the public, specifically for those being tested. And since that time, it's been recommended by Iowa Department of Public Health and other public health organizations nationally that um, it's a wiser use of resources to discontinue contact tracing. We will, Dubuque County will be um, receiving additional N95 masks and um, that's through our partnership with Hardy Drug Stores who are on a federal purchasing group. They are receiving um, free N95 mass through the federal stockpile and they will be available for community distri distribution in partnership with the IMT. Um, Tom Berger at the Emergency Management Agency will be our contact for that and we will be distributing those to organizations 
groups, um, institutions, whoever wants or needs N95 masks. And a study recently, well, just released last Friday on February 4th, in fact, did look at data from February through December 2021 in California and shows that really the consistent use of face mask or respirator use in indoor public settings was associated with lower odds of a positive COVID-19 test. And it, the respita respirators with the higher fil filtration capacity was associated with the most protection compared to no mask use. So we continue to recommend um, mask usage, whether vaccinated or not, and make sure they're well fitting and consistently wear, worn. So with that, um, that's the data I have to present to you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. All right, thank you very much, Mary Rose. Uh, what questions do we have for Mary Rose? Okay, well, I have one, Mary Rose. Um, so we, we appear to be in another transition phase here, um, you know, because we've gotten used to transition phases with all this. Um, and, and you tell me if anything I'm saying is wrong, but it appears that this is becoming more and more um, a regional issue. And you can kind of notice that when you look at, um, you know, the, the national policies that are changing across the board. I mean, we've got um, governors that still had school mask mandates in place taking those away. Uh, we've got the state of Iowa making numerous different changes here to the way they're going to report or what they're going to track and how we're working with this. And essentially, I mean, our governor is saying that, um, declaring that the emergency is over. So, you know, as it becomes more regional, we have to think about this here um, for what is happening here in Dubuque and in our region. It would appear that the, the main concern that we've had this whole time about healthcare capacity and the number of folks who are needing hospitalization, it's a pretty steady decline. So, as we look ahead over the next couple of weeks here, um, what are some things that you and the incident management team see as changes that we may begin to institute uh, based on the numbers that you're seeing? Well, Mr. Mayor, this is Mary Rose Corrigan, public health specialist again. Um, first of all, it's, it's somewhat been regional for a very long time in the fact that these ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys of the incidence of the virus are kind of different around the country somewhat and vary by a couple of weeks. So for instance, right now on the East Coast, they've been on the downward slide from Omicron for several weeks and we're just, we've just started that. And so uh, the regionalization um, and the, in terms of the incidence of the virus is ongoing and nobody really knows why, by the way haven't figured that one out either on a national basis or a global basis. But in response to your question, one thing we, we already have done is um, discontinue that individual contact tracing. And we pretty much expected the governor's proclamation going away eventually um, in this week, in next week, in that it kind of happens with a lot of other newly emerging infections and diseases we've dealt with. The, in, when a disease becomes suddenly or in an epidemic mode, or is in this case pandemic mode, we do special things in order to address it in terms of reporting and testing and a lot of things like we've done now. And then pretty soon, as the disease becomes a little more endemic, which we're entering that period where we almost expect it, and we expect that it will not go away completely, which is what I think we're experiencing now and predicting for the future. So it, in somewhat, it becomes somewhat um, integrated into our regular communicable disease, excuse me, reportable communicable disease monitoring and response. So like we have with, for example, influenza, that's kind of also a regional thing, at least during the winter months here in this country. And we receive weekly and bi-weekly state reports on influenza and keep in touch with the hospitals on what they're seeing in terms of influenza and how we can assist and, and help pre prevent the spread of that. COVID may is going to eventually 
be integrated with our regular diseases. We don't know quite yet if it'll be seasonal like influenza, but um, the reporting will become um, more predictable and uh, integrated in with other things. So for instance, this fall, the Iowa Department of Public Health will update its weekly flu re influenza reports to include Omicron, but also several other respiratory viruses, which will, will actually help public health and healthcare providers in planning and responding to these things. And so it's, it's becoming um, part of our repertoire of diseases we have to deal with. And as with any of those, we respond when the cases go up um, more aggressively and with more information and um, resources and um, services for the public. And when it, those diseases go down, um, we pull back on some of those. Um, it's happened with pertussis or whooping cough in the past and measles and West Nile virus and a variety <coughs> of other. This is just exceptional because it's in the pandemic mode and it's you know, lasted for over two years. So we will see a gradual decline of our response. I think we'll keep, you know, we are gonna start evaluating, you know, our, our reporting, um, how much we're meeting with community providers in the next few weeks. And a lot of it's based on what they need. Um, but the discussion on a lot of our meetings with, for instance, the vaccine <coughs> providers in the schools, and the testing providers and the other many other entities we meet with is there's not really a lot of discussion our meetings used to last for hours and now they're lasting sometimes a half hour um you know not very long people have learned where to find the information they need and uh, and they know what to do with this and the guidance changes are more infrequent also and so there's not quite the need for us to be out there telling people what to do because it's the same thing for a while. Um, I've kind of thrown a lot of things at you there, but it's um, we're looking at how we're gonna change and it's gonna be a little bit of shift because you know we've all been operating in 70 to 90% COVID mode. And so, we'll decide, you know, gradually pull back from some of those responses as they're not um, needed anymore. I hope that addresses what you were getting at. Yeah, it did. I, I actually really appreciate the detailed answer because I think, um, you know, it is it is a time that we're going to be transitioning again, and it's pretty clear that you've got some things in mind, and I appreciate that. So without any other questions, oh, Mr. Resnick, Mr. yes. Mayor, thank you, and you both uh, talked about it a little bit, uh, but um, do you um, do we have criteria established that you would be able to recommend an, uh, an end to the mask mandate for city facilities? Up to this point, um, Councilman Redsnick, we've we've continued to follow the CDC guidance on that, and that'll be um, one thing we need to meet internally with the city staff that has created that safe work guidance and the facil city facility guidance. Um, so I don't think we developed that criteria yet. I'm sure a lot of it will be based on what I recommend. And um, I would like to see some of the metrics um, that CDC would look at. And I know one of them is transmission rate. And for sure it would have to go to um, the low or the step just right above low before they would recommend that. So considering we're still two steps above that at high, I think it's gonna be a while, but they, I'm sure they will look at um, transmission rate, level of vaccination, and they'll probably, we would probably look at hospital data since it is, even though it is a lagging indicator. Um, those will be a couple of things we'll look at for sure. Thank you. All right. All right, Mary Rose, well, thank you very Mr. much Mayor. for that report. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add, so Mary Rose will continue to give uh, a report to the city council at the first council meeting of the month for a few more months. Um, you'll remember it used to be every council meeting, and then we switched to just one, and we'll continue that and hopefully get good news along the way. Um, but 
one thing we all have to keep in mind is that um, we still will have safety measures within our city facilities and um, the people are still dying of this and it's not just uh, frail people and some that aren't dying are seriously ill and, and I'm talking about weeks on a ventilator and I'm talking about situations I'm personally knowledgeable of so I'm not just talking about something I read about in the paper mm -hmm. and uh, so we still feel we have a real strong responsibility to our employees uh, most of our employees can't work from home that's not a realistic situation and we also feel we have a responsibility to our customers and residents so for now we are going to continue to uh, be uh, very vigilant I appreciate that, Mike. Uh, thanks for adding that information for us. Okay. Well, Mary Rose, thank you very much, as always, for everything that you're doing, and uh, we appreciate the report tonight. You're welcome. Okay. Adrian. Next, under proclamations, we have the Captain Robert L. Martin proclamation. Okay, and I understand that we have RRS Stewart on the line to accept this virtually. RS, are you there with us? This is Gabrielle Martin, Captain Martin's daughter, and I think our RS said she was going to be there if we could. There she is. Yes, I'm here. Ah, hello, both of you. Thank you for being here. RS, do you have anything you'd like to say before I read this proclamation? Uh, just that um, I'm treasurer for the Captain Robert L. Martin Commemoration Committee, and we thank you for the proclamation. And as you can see, uh, Robert Martin's daughter, Gabrielle, is also on here, and I think she'll say a few words at the end when you finish reading the proclamation. Okay. All right. Wonderful. I'll go ahead and read it, and then uh, we'll be happy to hear from you, Gabrielle. <clears throat> City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas Robert L. Martin was born in Dubuque on February 9th, 1919, graduated from Dubuque Senior High School and earned a degree from Iowa State University. And whereas Robert Martin graduated from the Army Air Corps Tuskegee Flight Experiment and received his wings as a fighter pilot on January 7th, 1944. He was assigned to the 100th Fighter Squadron, a part of the 332nd Fighter Group assigned to the European Theater Operations. And whereas the elite Tuskegee Airmen were dedicated, determined young men who volunteered to become America's first black military airmen and broke racial barriers to become the most respectable fighter group in a segregated military that previously never thought blacks could fly planes in defense of their country. And whereas the Tuskegee Airmen were called red tails because of the crimson paint on the tails of their P-51 Mustangs and are renowned for their documented 1,578 successful missions during which they maintained one of the lowest loss records of all the escort fighter groups. And whereas Robert Martin was originally commissioned a second lieutenant and rose to the rank of captain, Captain Robert Martin's legacy is to be shared and remembered for the generations to come with the naming of the Captain Robert L. Martin Terminal at Dubuque Regional Airport in his honor. And whereas a celebration will be held for Captain Robert Martin's birthday at Dubuque Regional Airport on Wednesday, February 9th, 2022, from 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and citizens of Dubuque, do hereby recognize the birthday of Captain Robert L. Martin during Black History Month in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and call upon the citizens of Dubuque to further affirm the rich stories of local heroes. Gabrielle, we'll take it back to you if you have a few things you'd like to say. Uh, Gabrielle, you're still muted. All right, thank you. I'm trying to be good. Um, thank you, everyone. I've been looking at some pictures in the last week for our project, and I was realizing that you know, sometimes people say you never go home. And it reminded me, those pictures, that the place we call home is forever in our hearts because we remember the people, the places, regardless of where our physical presence is. So it's a wonderful tribute from the citizens of Dubuque who remember my father and on behalf of the family, I extend a humble thank you for keeping dad, his accomplishments, and his birthday in your hearts and memories. So thank you again. 
Well, thank you, Gabrielle. And we'd just for... like to oh, go ahead, invite Arlen. all of the council members to come out to the airport on Wednesday at 530. Gabrielle and her sister, Dominique, will be there in person uh, to give a presentation about Robert, and you'll get a chance to meet them if you come out. Well, thank you both for that information and for presenting this proclamation to us. We are um, we're very happy to be able to do this and, and very proud to, to be able to, to move in this direction of naming the terminal for Captain Martin. So thank you both for being here, and we look forward to the event. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you. All right, Adrian. We can move on to consent items. All right. So we'll, we'll move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Okay, thank you, Adrian. So first I'll bring it here to the chamber. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like anything on the consent agenda held for separate discussion? All right, is there anyone virtually? We do not have anyone virtually in the chat and we have unmuted our phone participants as well. Okay. Mr. Mayor, Mayor, I'll just state for the record that there was um, one public input received via email. Mary Geisler, 2310 High Cloud Drive, provided input on consent item number 25 to the city council this morning, and that input was uploaded with the agenda item. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. We appreciate that. All right. Hearing no one else from the public, then I'll bring it back to the table. Would anyone here like anything held for separate discussion? Uh, Mr. Sprint. Mayor, yes, I would like item number 25 held back for separate discussion. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Mr. Redick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number 13 and number 25. You can second that. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Resnick, a second by Mr. Sprank. Um, Mr. Sprank, you held 25. I'll go to you first, and then Mr. Resnick can come back to you for number 13. Uh, or did, did, would, did you want to hold 13 specifically? Uh, Adrian Breitfelder, city clerk. So just for clarification, um, can the entire consent item number 13 uh, was not requested to be um, held from the agenda. There's just one specific assessment within uh, the consent item. So we do have an amended schedule of assessments that's being presented. Well, thank you for that information. So it's been corrected. So I'll amend my uh, motion to uh, receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number 25. Okay. All right. You want to second that, Mr. Sprank? I will second that, yes. Okay. All right. Then I'll come to you, Mr. Sprank, for number 25. Yeah. Um, my question is for oh, our city course. manager. Oh, we, I'm sorry. We need to vote. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Thank vote you. first, then move on. All right. All right. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. All right. That motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Krenna, very much for keeping me on task there. Uh, Mr. Sprank, I'll come to you for 25. Yes. Uh, 25 is, we're going to be, uh, it's about our wonderful H&W malt, or the malt brewing building. Um, and my question was to our city manager, uh, what's the next steps working with this, with uh, 3000 Jackson Street LLC? Yes. Um, thank you. City manager, Mike Van Milligan. Well, as uh, part of uh, <coughs> declaring them in default of the development agreement, you'll recall that originally the city provided them $500,000 advance on this project, but they were required uh, to have a letter of credit with a bank. So if they defaulted on the agreement, uh, the city would get their money back. So uh, with that $500,000, we hope to do what we can to stabilize uh, the building if there are any things that we feel we have responsibility for from a safety perspective. Um, and uh, in the alternative to that would be if they were to resell the building to somebody else, we could use those dollars to partner with whoever the new owner would be. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately, now that we're not in a partnership with them on redeveloping the project, 
Um, we will be looking at enforcement action on the activities that are happening there that we don't think are safe, that we don't think the building is being properly stabilized. And so we'll have to put our trust in the court system that they'll help us uh, compel uh, the owner to um, maintain and stabilize the building. Uh, but all that being said, uh, we're also not giving up on them. So they're still the owners of the building and uh, they've made public statements that th their intention is still to seek uh, financing options to allow them to redevelop the structure. And so if they were to come back with another uh, development agreement proposal that we believed was compelling, we certainly would be willing to partner with them again. And I do have one more question. Mm -hmm. This might be a legal question, so Krana, sorry. Um, do we have any legal responsibility or legal recourse that we could actually investigate the property ourselves? Because technically, wouldn't that be without being like trespassing, shall we say, to actually do like some type of structural engineer report? Is that possible or how or is that even possible to do something, to go down that avenue? Yes, uh, within the code, we adopt the international codes, there are right of entry provisions in those codes that allow us um, limited inspections. We then also have other remedies as a mechanism of state code if we need access um, to interior pieces of the building or within you know, the four corners of the property. Because my biggest concern is safety, is we don't want any of these things falling down on any, on any of the residential, residential houses nearby or and it's probably not ha going to happen, but it's still, it's a big building and if one of those towers collapses, who knows what type of damage we could be doing to, uh, not only that, to our streets and our infrastructure, so that's all. So that's it. So. Mm -hmm. Any other, yeah, Mr. Jones? Just a comment uh, relative to some of the comments that I heard today. Um, it's important that people understand, the city manager just, just said it, the city of Dubuque does not own this building. It's still under private ownership. Um, so the next move is up to them. Um, the enforcement actions, obviously, we'll, we're compelled to, to do a good job of, of keeping the building safe and keeping the neighborhood safe. Um, but it's real important for people to understand we don't own the building. We don't control its destiny. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any other questions or discussion? All right. I'd entertain a motion. Uh, I'd make a motion that we uh, receive and file and adopt the resolution. Okay. Second by Farber. All right, you have a motion by Sprang, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion passes 6 0. We'll move on to items set for public hearing, and we have three. First is vacating portions of sanitary sewer utility easements over Ichabon Realty LLC property at 3187 University Drive in Dubuque. Second is sale of city-owned property at 2247 Central Avenue. And third is sale of city-owned property at 351 East 15th Street. All three set for public hearing for February 21st, 2022. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Uh, Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for February 21st. Second. I have a motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. We'll move on to boards and commissions, and we have boards and commissions applicant review for the Community Development Advisory Commission, Housing Commission, and Resilient Community Advisory Commission, and appointments to be made for the Historic Preservation Commission. All right. We'll go with the uh, Community Development Advisory Commission. First, we have two three-year terms open through February 15th, 2022. We have applications from Dean Bowles, Michelle Hinkey, and Sasha Williams. Is there anyone present um, in the chambers or virtually to address the council on any of these applications? All right, seeing no one, we will move on to the Housing Commission. We have two three-year terms through August 17th, 2024. Um, there's an at-large term and then a Section 8 representative term. We have two applicants, Renee Kehoe and Charlene Turpin. Is there anyone present in the chambers or virtually to address the council on these applications? All right, seeing no one, 
Move on to Resilient Community Advisory Commission. We have one three-year term through July 1st, 2022, um, and we have one applicant, Josh Chamberlain. Is there anyone present to address the council on this application? Good evening, yes, sir, come on up, yep. And you can, uh, as you get there, you can adjust the mic so we can hear you. Feel free to leave your mask on, take it off, whatever you're most comfortable with. Cool. Good evening, city council members. Uh, my name is Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, I live at 2145 Delaware Street, right here in Dubuque. Uh, I'm originally from Milford, Ohio, a small city <coughs> just outside uh, the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Uh, I went to college at Bowling Green State University in Northwest Ohio, where I graduated uh, with a master's in public administration in uh, 2017. Um, after graduating, uh, I did a nationwide job search, ended up working at University of Wisconsin Platteville as their waste minimization coordinator for the past four years. Um, so I've been a resident of Dubuque since May of 2020. Um, in September 2021, I accepted the position as the first stewardship and sustainability coordinator at University of Dubuque in collaboration with the Dubuque Metropolitan Area Solid Waste Agency. In this role, uh, I'm coordinating institutional sustainability initiatives at UD, as well as facilitating the Dubuque College's Sustainability Coalition uh, and assisting with capacity building throughout the larger county. Uh, I'm thrilled at the opportunity to live, work, and now serve the city I call home. And so I just wanted to say thank you all for your consideration and time and wanted to open this uh, opportunity uh, to ask questions about myself, my background, any of that stuff. So yeah. thanks, y'all. Any questions for Mr. Chamberlain? Okay. Well, Joshua, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it and appreciate your application. Thanks, y'all. All right. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. All right, then we can move on to the uh, appointment for the Historic Preservation Commission. We have one three-year term through July 1st, 2023, and another three-year term through July 1st, 2024. Um, note that uh, one is a vacant Langworthy term and the other is an at-large term. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. I move to appoint the Dement to the Langworthy Historic District. Second by Roussel. We have a motion by Mr. Resnick and second by Ms. Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, Thea Dement is uh, appointed to the three year term um, for the Langworthy. I'm sorry, I missed. It's for the Langworthy term, correct? Okay, thank you. All right, I'll entertain a motion for the second position. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Jones? I move that Melissa Castle be appointed to the at large opening. Second by Sprank. We have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion passes 6 0. Melissa Castle is appointed to the three year at large term. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items. Please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question, or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. And public hearing number one is resolution approving a development agreement between the city of Dubuque, Iowa and Clower Manufacturing Company for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second, second by, by Farber. Frank. We have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Ms. Farber. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the resolution approving a development agreement between the City of Dubuque and Clower Manufacturing Company providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations. The key elements of the development agreement include the following. Number one, the developer must construct a building of not less than 73,000 square feet with a cost of approximately $10 million. Number two, Clower Manufacturing Company must retain its current 151 full-time positions at the current facilities and create 16 new jobs at the current facilities or the new expansion by January 1st, 2024. The 167 jobs must be retained through the term of the development agreement. 
Number three, Clower Manufacturing Company must be awarded state tax incentives. Number four, Clower Manufacturing Company will receive 10 years of tax increment financing in incentives in the form of semi-annual rebates. These incentives are calculated in relation to the number of jobs committed in the development agreement. Tax increment financing incentives are not estimated to exceed $1,587,632. <coughs> Approval of the development agreement and issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations will further the City Council's goal of creating a robust local economy. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. And I do believe we have uh, representatives from Clower Manufacturing here to address the Council as well. So I'll invite you up to, to address now if you uh, have a few things to say. Mike Igo, Vice President of Clower Manufacturing Company. <clears throat> uh, uh, Mayor, Council Members, uh, good evening. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak on behalf of our company. Um, and we thank you for, our, uh, for your support of our expansion project. So we greatly appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> we have a few slides here um, to give a little bit of background on Clower. Um, I, I promise not to cover all 152 years. Uh, we were. Um, <laughs> Uh, slide number one here, we were founded in 1870. Uh, we celebrated our 150th year in 2020, which was a, an awful time to try to have a celebration. Um, but we are family owned, always have been family owned and operated uh, a fifth generation management team in place today. Uh, we have a sixth generation on deck, eagerly on deck. That's actually part of our long-term company goals is to prepare the next generation uh, uh, to take over. Um, if you ask our customers in our industry, you know, who was Clower, they will tell you that Clower stands for quality and, and service. That's, uh, <clears throat> that is our branding, that's who we are. Um, we ship our products throughout the, uh, the lower 48 uh, with customers in 40 plus states. Um, we currently have 160 employees, that includes a few, uh, few part-time. We have actually have 42 employees living in the downtown area, which <clears throat> we uh, 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 kind of dug into recently and trying to figure out how to market ourselves and how to attract uh, employees. We're, uh, we have 34 open positions, so we're you know, trying to market ourselves is, is, is pretty important today. Um, our plant pay range uh, opportunities today are between $20 and $30 an hour. Uh, we have currently have four office positions, salary positions open, two HR uh, uh, professional positions, and then we have uh, two plant supervisory positions as well. Um, and then to give you a little perspective of the scope of what we do, in 2021 we processed 40 million pounds of steel and aluminum uh, here in Dubuque. So, slide two here. Um, our presence in downtown, we've always been in downtown. Um, just to kind of walk through the, the progression. We started off in Iowa Street, it was a, a, a tin shop and hardware store, it was Peter Clower's business. Um, he was a tenor, immigrated here from Germany in the uh, 1850s. Um, early 1900s, the, uh, the company grew quite a bit. And we had <clears throat> facilities on both sides of 9th Street for a, a city block long, and it was uh, just east of Washington Street. Uh, those buildings are no longer there. Um, uh, the highway project came through, which ended up this, which is how we ended up on, uh, off of, in the Kerper uh, 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 complex, the uh, industrial park. Uh, we have a, a facility at 2600 Washington Street, 125,000 square feet. Our current uh, square footage at our Roosevelt Street plan is 125,000 square feet. And then we op occupy a warehouse on Kerper that's 50,000 square feet. Um, our 2600 Washington Street facility um, is a big part of our expansion plans. We need to maintain that facility. We need to operate there. It needs to be viable and be fully utilized. Um, our Roosevelt Street plant, uh, that's where the addition is going, 75,000 square feet, and it's about a $14 million uh, investment. That includes uh, some larger pieces of equipment as well as the construction costs. Uh, this is a overhead shot of uh, 
the plant on Roosevelt Street. Um, you, you see the, the, the light blue is the addition. Um, I do want to thank the, the Zoning Advisory Committee. Last week approved uh, two waivers that uh, allowed us to keep the existing parking lot intact, uh, which was a net result of more green space and less concrete. So some common sense prevailed there. So thank, thanks to those folks. And, uh, and as I mentioned, we have a lot of folks living downtown, and this is uh, our HR folks really dug in, and we're trying to figure out how, how do we attract people. Uh, and this is really interesting, and I, I think it's important to uh, understand when we talk about what we need to do at our 26, at our Washington Street facility. Um, so this is our Roosevelt plant in red, and these are people, these are 25 employees that live close to that facility. And then the, the, the red dot is our Washington Street plant, uh, and there's 17 employees that work at that plant that live in downtown. Um, <clears throat> so this project's been in the works for really about five years. Um, you know, deciding, find, you know, finally deciding to, to expand here in Dubuque, what we think is the right decision. Um, it's, it's um, however, it's, Imperative that we have two of our, both of our facilities have to be viable. We have to be able to operate efficiently. Um, we need to move material back and forth between the two plants efficiently. And then we need to have adequate truck traffic uh, and truck circulation uh, at that facility. Um, we've had, you know, a, n a number of problems over the years. Um, but, it, you know, we want to be good neighbors. We want to thrive in there. We want to uh, uh, add to the neighborhood. Um, you know, again, we have a lot of folks living right there. Uh, we've actually received a lot of feedback with interviews here recently uh, where, where the empl uh, potential employees are saying, hey, there's, uh, uh, there's public transportation. I can, walk to, I can walk to work. I can bike to work. Uh, I was driving by the other day, and it was last week. Someone pulled a bike out of a side door, and in the middle of winter, some people are biking to work uh, to that plant. So, um, we, um, you know, we understand the challenges associated with truck traffic in that part of town. We're very grateful to the city manager and city staff who came out last week, uh, uh, really worked to understand. I, I do think, I really believe they fully understand our issues, uh, and we're confident that dialogue will continue and will come to some reasonable solution that works for everyone and um, and uh, I want to thank Greater Dubuque for, for helping us through this process as well as the, the Groner group behind us. So um, that's all I have. If I answer a few questions, if you have any. Thank you, Mike. I think we'll uh, open up for public discussion here and then we'll see what questions we have. I might call you back up, okay? All right. So we are in a public hearing to uh, consider approval of a development agreement between the city of Dubuque and Clower Manufacturing Company, including the proposed issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations to Clower Manufacturing Company. Is there anyone in the council chambers to address us on this item? Or anyone virtually? There's not. And no public input via email. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Farber. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Mike and um, the Clower family and all of your management team, Grona and Greater Development, for um, basically continuing your commitment to Dubuque. Uh, Family-owned businesses, I think, are the key success factors for our economic growth, and just am so appreciative that you made the decision to expand here. And I know you have other offices elsewhere and other facilities, so just a big thank you. Uh, for supporting the economy and for the uh, the family friendship, if you will, uh, that is long established between the Clowers and the city. Thank you, Mr. Farber. You Mr. Sprang. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yes, I'd pretty much echo a lot of what Susan said. So thank you for, for staying in our cities. Thank you for staying in the North End. Um, I can echo a lot of the truck traffic issues. My company, my employers, just two blocks from your from your Washington Street, um, from your Washington Street factory. And sometimes we get your trucks; they get lost. They end up in our parking lot, or our, our trucks get lost and end up in your parking lot. So uh, I feel your pain with the truck traffic. It is something that we have to work on, and hopefully we can all come to a good uh, resolution on. So thank you again. So. 
Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. It, we've got a ton of work on uh, reducing truck traffic in the North End in general, and I, I just want to say straight up, it was never our intent to, to harm existing and growing Dubuque businesses. And so I, I'm assured that, that that will be worked out to, to keep you viable and keep trucks coming your way. The, our intent was never to, to create obstacles um, for your success and growth. So I, I certainly support this and, and uh, proud of this company and the things that you've uh, done in Dubuque, the people that you employ in Dubuque, and the, the products that you export from Dubuque. You, you build some pretty interesting stuff. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Other comments? All right, then before we call for a vote, I'll just, a uh, whole lot of echoing going on. I'll say the same, um, you know, really appreciate your commitment to the city of Dubuque. Um, wish you another 150 years to, to be able to continue to do that. Um, you know, the issue before us is the development agreement itself, um, and, and then there's the separate issue of the, the truck traffic. That's like an ongoing conversation that I'm sure, uh, it sounds to me like it's going well so far. But as far as the development agreement, um, I think this is a, a great use of a development agreement to be able to um, uh, continue to, to thrive here in Dubuque and to build onto a location in an area that uh, we definitely want to see more growth. and. Um, very much appreciate that you're able to serve downtown and the whole city in this way. So I definitely will be supporting this as well. Without any further comments then, uh, Adrian, would you call the roll please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. That motion passes 6-0. Public hearing number two is amending precinct 15 boundary description. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Oh, good. Microsoft wants to show me their new look instead of my motion. <laughs> I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. We have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Sprank. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Planning Services Manager Wally Warnemont is recommending approval of ordinance amending the Precinct 15 boundaries. At a December 6, 2021 City Council public hearing, the City Council approved Ordinance 4321, which adopted the 2021 redistricting plan for city wards and precincts. After approval, as required by state law, planning staff provided the plan to the Secretary of State for final approval. After reviewing the documents, it was found that there was a minor error in the boundary description for Precinct 15, which includes portions of Dubuque County and the City of Dubuque. The boundary of Precinct 15 should be adjusted by moving the western boundary from John Deere Road to Gardner's Lane. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider amending Title I, uh, Administration of the City of Dubuque Code by amending Chapter 8, Elections, Precincts and Wards by updating Section 18, Precinct 15 Boundary descrip Description to reflect the 2021 Wards and Precincts Redistricting Plan. Is there anyone in the chambers to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? Not on this item. No emails received. All right, bring it back to the table for any discussion. All right, seeing none, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. We have a motion by Mr. Jones, a second by Mr. Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the city council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the city council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the city council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. 
All right. Do we have anyone to address the Council for Public Input? Anyone virtually? There are no comments. Okay. And no emails received. Okay. And hearing none, we can move on. We'll move on to action items, and our only action item is American Rescue Plan Act and Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Presentation Request for Work Session. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and uh, to watch the presentation. Actually, I think um, we are scheduling a work session on this one, Mr. Resnick. Okay, so yep. the presentation will be then. Uh, sorry, excuse me. So I um, uh, move to receive and file and schedule the work session for Monday, May 7th at 5.30 p.m. And sorry to clarify again, but one more is March 7th. So just so we know, just so we're clear on the motion. What did I say? May, but it's okay. They're both M months and, you know. Let me make this larger, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> it's not, it's a, I just wanted to make sure we were clear. I just want to make sure we were all looking at the same date. That's all. So I think we... I think we have a clear motion. What do they say about a third time? <laughs> okay, Mr. Mayor, I move to receive and file and, and set the work session for Monday, March 7th, 2022 at 5.30. I said 7th, right? Yep, yep, that was right. Thank you very much, Mr. Resnick. All right, thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Resnick, a very clear one, uh, second by Ms. Roussel. Uh, does that work for everybody? Okay, then Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. Next are council member reports. All right. Any reports tonight? All right. Then, hearing none, I see we do have a closed session. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones? I move that we're going to closed session. In accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss purchase or sale of real estate. All right, motion by Mr. Jones, second by Ms. Farber. Um, Adrian, I'm sorry, remind me, do I, do I read the, the record now and then we go for the vote? Okay, thank you. So then for the record, the attorney the City Council will consul consult with on the issues to be discussed in the closed session is City Attorney Corinna Brumwell. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. We are in closed session. 